What's going on people? In this video, I'll be explaining part two of Attack on Titan's final season in around 10 minutes or less. In case you're new to the channel, last year I did make a separate video breaking down the complete timeline for part one. So if you're looking for a refresher on everything, then I recommend you start with that. For everyone else, let's get into Attack on Titan part two, which kicks off with the Marlians invading Shigantuna. The main goal of this surprise operation was for them to quickly steal the Founding Titan, hence why both Porco and Reiner tried to eat Eren whenever they happened to get the chance. On top of that, you had hundreds of armed Marlian soldiers entering the district by parachutes, and their job was to wipe out the scouts, therefore reducing the amount of protection that Eren had. For a while, this game plan did actually work quite well, with the Attack Titan struggling to handle two Titan shifters and an anti-Titan cannon at the same time. This struggle directly led to Onyankopon begging Mikasa and the other prisoners for assistance, and in the end, Armin does convince them to help out. His sales pitch was that even though it looks like Eren has betrayed them to join Zeke's side, the reality is that Zeke's plan to end the Eldian race doesn't sound like something their friend would agree to. For that reason, Armin's theory was that Eren is only using Zeke to activate the Founding Titan's powers, and once he succeeds in doing that, he can trigger a small-scale rumbling which would scare away their enemies for at least the next 50 years. The gang then suit up and get ready to defend him, but by the time they arrive, Eren was already receiving backup from the Beast Titan. The last time we saw Zeke, he'd blown both himself and Levi to pieces with a Thunder Spear, but thanks to his royal blood privilege, this random pure titan rebuilt his body by sacrificing its own muscle. Levi wasn't so lucky in that he lost one of his eyes and a couple of fingers, however, due to his Ackerman blood, he was at least durable enough to survive. Now, if you remember, back in part one of the final season, Flock forced Hanji to take them to Zeke's location. And when they finally got there in part two, Hanji escaped down the river with Levi's body, while the Jaegerist brought Zeke back to Shiganshina. When they got there, the Beast Titan then used his signature attack to crush a chunk of Malian soldiers, a chunk of Malian airships, and also Reiner, clearing a direct path for Eren to reach him. The two brothers knew that if they made physical contact, the Founding Titan's power would activate, and so for right now, the aim of the Jaegerists and the Scouts was to make that happen, while Marley's aim was to stop it happening above everything else. As the battle progressed, Zeke was nearly killed by Magat's anti-Titan cannon, and although the shot wasn't fatal, it put him in a tricky position where he couldn't defend Eren with his pitching assault. This is what gave Reiner an opening to pin down the attack titan, and so to save his brother, Zeke uses his scream to create a massive distraction. As we know, by this point in the timeline, there were hundreds of people in Giganchina who'd been tricked into drinking his spinal fluid, including Pixis and Falco, and by screaming, he turned every last one of them into a pure titan. During the chaos, Falco initially tries to eat Reiner before turning his attention to Porco who kind of sacrificed himself, and by eating Galliard, Falco inherited the Jaw Titan. Simultaneously, Eren was frantically running to make contact with Zeke with help from Connie and Jean as well, but at the last second, Gabby blasts his head off with an anti-Titan rifle. If we're being honest, this should have been the end of the whole story, but by pure luck, Eren's decapitated head lands directly into his brother's hand. What this meant is that the Founding Titan had made contact with the Titan of Royal Blood, and as a result, they were both sent into the Paz Dimension. Because time works differently in here, Eren felt like he arrived almost instantly, whereas from Zeke's point of view, he'd been waiting here for what felt like years. That's why, as you can see, his beard was looking a lot more raggedy than usual. However, this never would have happened if he'd known about Manscaped. Right now, Manscaped is offering 20% off plus free international shipping on their Beard Hedger Pro Kit, which is this all-in-one beard grooming solution. In case you don't know, Manscaped is used by over 9 million men around the world, and that number is only growing thanks to the premium design and modern feel of all of their products. Personally, I've been using the Beard Hedger for a month, and this thing comes with 20 different lengths that are built in, not to mention it has a titanium-coated blade that feels as smooth as anything. The Beard Hedger is also wireless, waterproof, and it just feels incredibly light, so you can easily bring it with you if you have to take an unexpected trip. If you want the Beard Hedger Pro Kit for 20% off, free shipping, and some free bonus gifts like the scissors and the brush, then all you have to do is go to manscaped.com slash turtlequirk, and when you're checking out, just put turtlequirk in the promo code box. Remember though, this deal is for a very limited time, so if you're interested in upgrading your current routine, then now is definitely the time to do it. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring today's video, and don't forget to use my link specifically if you want to help out the channel as well. Now, moving back to part two, in the past dimension, Zeke was restricted in change due to the Vow renouncing war, and so it came down to Eren to control the Founder's power. 
back when the brothers spoke in Mali, they agreed that they'd use this power to sterilize the entire Eldian race, but just as Armin predicted, Eren never wanted to go along with this. Instead, his real aim was to eradicate all life beyond the walls, ensuring that the island would be safe forever, and guaranteeing that Historia won't need to become a Titan Shifter. Unfortunately for Eren, Zeke had already suspected that a betrayal might happen, and so during the long time he spent in this dimension by himself, he learned how to override the vow renouncing war. To explain how, it's worth mentioning that 2000 years ago, a creature known as the source of all living matter transformed a slave girl called Ymir into the first titan. For the next 13 years, Ymir then served the Eldian Empire, hoping that the king would show her the kind of love that she wanted since she was young. Although he never did, her soul continued to obey the royal bloodline even after her death, and since Zeke arrived here without his mind being tainted by the will of Karl Fritz, he did eventually manage to get her on his side. As a consequence, the founder's power belonged to him specifically, and he was only pretending to be restricted so that he could hear Eren's true feelings. Despite being betrayed though, Zeke did still want to help out his younger brother, cause you know, he just assumed that Eren had been brainwashed by their dad in the exact same way that he was. For that reason, Zeke transports them into their father's memories to show Eren the truth, but what they discover is that there was no brainwashing, and that Eren is just naturally the way he is. Another surprise is that as they watch the memories from the day Grisha killed the royal family, Zeke finds out about the Attack Titan's special ability. To put it simply, people who have the Attack Titan, like Grisha, are sometimes able to see the memories of future users of the Attack Titan, like Eren. What this means is that present day Eren is able to communicate with Grisha from the past by sending back memories from this exact moment. Using this method, Eren gives his dad the motivation he needs to destroy the royal family, and by doing so, he sets the entire story into motion. When the brothers then arrive back in Paths, Zeke orders his slave to sterilize the Eldian people, whereas Eren speaks to Ymir as a human being and offers her the opportunity to end the world and free herself from the Paths dimension. A tearful Ymir then agrees to this proposal, and in the real world, Eren's head reconnects with the source of all living matter. What follows this is all Titan hardening in the world coming undone, hundreds of thousands of Titans being released and ready to trample the world, and finally Eren transforming into this gigantic monster. Although you could say the scouts were expecting a rumbling of some kind, each of them did feel kind of uneasy by the scale of what was about to happen. Before they had time to really think about it though, there were two big problems they had to address. Problem number one was that all of Zeke's pure titans were now rampaging through Shigantina, and problem number two was the question of what they should do about Falco. Given that he inherited the Jaw Titan, feeding Falco to someone like Pixis would turn them back into a human. From Connie's point of view, he was understandably more eager to revive his mother, who's been like this for the past four years, and so he just nabs Falco while the rest of the scouts were busy cleaning up Zeke's mess. Elsewhere on the island, Levi and Hanji were on the run from the Jaegerists, and in a purely coincidental meeting, they approached Peek and Magath to team up. In this scenario, both sides did actually have mutual interest, considering that they both wanted to kill Zeke, and neither of them wanted a full-scale rumbling. To grow their alliance, later that same night, after all of Zeke's titans were destroyed, Hanji convinces Jean and Mikasa to join them, while at the same time, Armin tries to gain Gabi's trust. Armin's belief is that if the outside world is destroyed, he doesn't want there to be a second war between the surviving warriors and the surviving scouts. Earning Gabi's trust is one step towards making sure that doesn't happen, and so the two of them race to Ragako village to save Falco from getting eaten. Ultimately, they do make it there just in time, with Armin heroically offering to sacrifice himself instead of Falco, only for Connie to swoop in and save him at the last moment. After some self-reflection, Connie then gives up on bringing his mother back this way, and he joins the group as they head back to Shiganshina. Along the way, the four of them then happen to bump into Annie, aka the female Titan, who was freed from her crystal the moment that Eren undid all Titan hardening. Since being free, Annie's only objective has been to get back to her father in Liberio, and so to accomplish this, she becomes the newest member of the Alliance. Finally, the last few people added to the group are Reiner, Onyankapon, and Yelena, and although Yelena isn't exactly an ally, Magath wanted to bring her along for tactical reasons. As you'd expect, she's one of the few people who knows the direction that Eren's likely going, cause she was the one who taught him all about Mali and, you know, the geography surrounding it. The next day, the group then arrives at the port, and their mission here was to capture the Azamabito's flying boat, and then use it to get close to Eren. 
The issue is that by this point, Flock realized that the scouts had betrayed them, and so he gathered an army of Jaegerists to take full control of the port. As if that wasn't bad enough, they also strapped explosives to the flying boat itself, and had taken the Asmabito engineers as hostages, creating an incredibly tricky situation for the Alliance. Initially, Armin and Connie's plan was to trick the Jaegerists without needing to resort to violence, but the plan fails when Flock attempts to kill the engineers. What follows this is an all-out war between both sides, with the scouts having to murder their own friends to make sure that the flying boat doesn't get damaged. The female and armored titans then join the battle as well, and although the engineers are saved, they reveal that it takes them half a day to get the flying boat ready. This presents an even worse problem since protecting the boat for half a day is quite literally impossible when you have waves of Jaegerists that can be brought in one after the other. In the end, Kiyomi proposes an alternate plan where they set sail to the Malian city of Odaha where they can get the flying boat ready without having enemies trying to kill them. Although the downside of this plan is that if they don't time it correctly, it's feasible that the rumbling would trample them before the boat is ready to fly. Regardless, the rest of the Alliance agrees to this plan, and despite being outnumbered, they brutally tear down nearly all of the Aegris, with special help from Falco's Jaw Titan. Possibly one of the most surprising things about this whole battle though is Keith Shardis making an appearance as he blows up an entire train full of Flock's reinforcements. After that, Flock himself is then shot down by Gabby, while many of the surviving Jaegerish decide to run away rather than, you know, sticking around and getting their heads cut off by Mikasa. The Alliance then successfully begin making their way towards Odeha, but not before we get two extra deaths. In the port, there was one other ship that could potentially catch up to Armin's group and destroy their ship, and so Magath stays behind to destroy it. Instructor Shardis also decides to join him, and this was a nice moment since Shardis used to think of himself as an irrelevant bystander, but here Magath tells him that if it wasn't for him blowing up that train, the Alliance would already be dead. The two men then explode as they detonate the last remaining ship, and with that the rest of the group is able to escape. Now, flashing back one year, you'll remember that in part one of the final season, Hanji proposed that the scouts should take a trip to Mali so they can understand the enemy. In the final episode of part two, we're then shown exactly what happened during this trip, and what the scouts found was a world that was even more hostile towards Eldians than they originally thought. On the flip side though, there were also good people who didn't deserve to be squashed by the rumbling, and during this trip, Eren struggled to decide what exactly he should do. Years earlier, when he kissed Historia's hand, he saw visions of the rumbling and knew it was likely going to happen, but there was one specific moment where he almost deviated from that future. That specific moment came on this trip when he asked Mikasa about her feelings for him, because in this moment, if she had told him the truth, then he was prepared to walk away from the future he saw. However, for better or worse, she family zoned him, setting into motion a chain of events where he left the scouts, infiltrates Marley, meets up with Zeke, and does everything that led up to the current moment. On the boat to Odaha, Mikasa wonders to herself what would have happened if she'd given him a different answer, while at the same time in another part of Marley, Eren's army of titans wipes out a global alliance of military ships and tramples an entire city full of people to dust. With that said, that was part 2 of Attack on Titan the final season in around 10 minutes or less, and if you enjoyed this video then don't forget to like and subscribe, especially if you don't want to miss my recap for part 3. Until the next one, peace out!